Well, it's four o'clock, so why don't we get going? Um, if folks um, can introduce themselves in the chat, that would be great. Um, please let us know who you are and where you're from and uh, um, how, how you got connected to, to this meeting or some other point of connection that you have, the kind of work you do, those kinds of things. Um, We've, uh, I'm sure we'll have more folks who, uh, who join us and watch afterwards online, but we've got a small crew here today. So folks uh, um, on, on the attendee list, everyone at chat, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand and we can give you the mic and go from there. Um, but uh, great to see some familiar names from uh, discussion forums and, and uh, other connections that we've had in the past. So nice to see you all here. Um, our goal today is to have a discussion supporting students in the aftermath of the 2020 election with youth in front. Um, you know, lots of us are trying to figure out, you know, how do we, uh, you know, I, I, how, how do we navigate conversations about the election? Um, you know, my own kids are in school right now and certainly the, the dominant um, theme in our um, small rural Vermont town, um, you, you know, sort of uh, leaning Biden, but evenly split, um, mostly white, is just the total absence of academic conversation about the election compared to previous years um, that, you know, that, uh, that I think t in, in you know, the, 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 in normal years, like there's a scholastic magazine that presents a little bit of the background of each of the candidates. And then you have a mock election and you have people talk about the issues and, and things like that. Um, and uh, so much of that is muted uh, um, in my community this year. And I, you know, I imagine that's one theme that's cutting across uh, lots of communities are out there. Um, so I think we just want to talk with each other about um, teaching and learning in this moment, you know, what, what can we do to, um, to keep, keep uh, the election um, and all the topics that surround it um, in our conversations and, and how do we do our best to navigate those challenging conversations. Um, and we will do that by um, talking about some resources that we have available to help folks with this, talking with some great teachers who are our advisors and guides in doing this work. Um, so why don't we go around and do some introductions and then we'll just kind of dive in. Um, so my name is Justin Reich. I'm a former high school history teacher um, and I run a lab at MIT called the Teaching Systems Lab, um, where we try to think about how teachers learn, how they learn online and how they learn difficult, challenging skills through practice. Um, and I'll just go around the people that I see. Nima, um, can we get you to introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Nima Avashia. I'm an eighth grade civics teacher at the McCormick Middle School in Dorchester, which is a neighborhood of Boston, and I've been teaching there for 18 years. Great. Thanks for joining us, Nima. Kevin? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Dua. I go by he and his pronouns. Um, I am a history teacher um, in the Cambridge Public Schools, and I've been a teacher uh, for history uh, for eight to nine years now. Great. Josh? Hey everyone, uh, I am Josh Lindbergh Tobias. I am a researcher at MIT. Um, I work with uh, Justin and I am um, working on a new uh, online course called uh, Teaching Challenging Issues in Uncertain Times. Uh, so I hope we're happy to talk about that a little bit more today, which will hopefully provide some strategies for talking about these issues in an online environment. A very, a very timely topic. And Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah O'Brien. I'm a curriculum writer for the online student, uh, supporting student activism course with Youth in Front. I'm also a middle school and high school uh, English teacher. I've been teaching for 10 years, although this year I am home um, with my second grader doing remote school. So if you have any questions about foundations or second grade math, I know everything. You're on it, you're on it, good. Um, and if folks are here live, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, in the chat, but otherwise let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, so Nima, in your class, what is, what is the election and the aftermath look like um, with your middle school students in Boston? You know, I've been, I've been teaching civics for a long time and I've taught a lot of presidential elections and I, I had a lot of dread 
um, coming up on this election. And I think a lot of it was related to 2016. Um, because in 2016, when I was teaching the Electoral College and we were looking at the polling data, the message that kids were getting again and again was that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Um, and then she didn't. And the thing that was most difficult for me about that election night was thinking about the fact that I was going to go in and face kids in the morning and have done, been irresponsible in a way, like not prepared them for that outcome. Um, and in the weeks leading up to this election, a lot of my students from 2016 who were in eighth grade then and are seniors now were reaching out to me. And I mm. felt like we were all kind of collectively like remembering and recalling like the trauma of that election. And it was really making it hard for me to think about how to responsibly teach an outcome, an election whose outcome like could go who knows which way? Like, again, the polling data, who the heck knows what's going to happen? Will he even admit that he lost? We don't know. So I really struggled with, like, what is the right way um, to, to teach an election whose outcome could go any which way? Um, and I ended up deciding to not spend as much time on it as I normally would. And we did talk about the electoral maps. We talked about how to watch, like what to look for. Um, but I didn't spend as much time digging into the beliefs of the candidates or their platforms or things that I might have in previous years. Also because I felt like for so many of my students, um, this wasn't a situation where they were gonna experience it as like evaluating two candidates and trying to decide which of them they align with more in terms of their values. Like my young people are majority black and Latino students. Like they, they, a lot of them were already kind of coming in with an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I did less. Um, and I don't know if that was the right thing to do, um, but I also was just really mindful that like, this is an online setting, like we are still just getting to know each other. And like, I wasn't sure like how much weight I could put into the online space responsibly and sort of know that and feel confident that I'd be able to hold like what resulted because what resulted in 2016, the day after the election was kids in my room in restorative justice circles, like crying. Um, and talking about how their identities were in, uh, threatened and how their identities were like being basically mocked and demeaned and disparaged by the person who'd just been elected. And I wasn't sure, I, I, I just felt, I felt unsure of what that, how that would translate into online space. Um, so I don't feel like I have a magic answer, but I'll just own that I feel like this was really hard and I'm not sure I made the right decision. Have you, I mean, I think I, th at least I think the decision you made aligned with lots of other folks that are out there. I mean, I, the, the story you're telling sounds resonant to me. Um, since in the days since the election, um, have you, have you sort of ramped up more? I mean, we're, you know, we're now in this kind of, it's not necessarily uncharted territory. I mean, things are proceeding like roughly the way that constitute, you know, things are proceeding constitutionally and legislatively the way that they're supposed to. And then, you know, in terms of like norms, they're being shattered, but we're sort of used to that too. Um, and, uh, and so it, is there more that you've done to sort of say like, oh, by the way, there's actually like a legal process that exists after November 3rd and here's how it goes to you know the, the electoral college and things like that yeah so I've been doing like a 10 minute election update every day mm. that just like in the first few days after the election was like all right let's look at the map let's talk about like what do we see happening on the electoral map now um we watched Kamala Harris's speech that she gave on Saturday night that was our Monday 10 minute election update so yes I'm doing like 10 minutes a day but again like really thinking about dosage and trying to just think about like what is the right amount um, to not sort of like overwhelm you or drown you in this, but also to make sure you feel like you have space to engage. And if it takes more than 10 minutes, then we take more than 10 minutes. But, yeah. um, but trying to just plan in like doses as opposed to like entire lessons about the election or the electoral yeah. college, which is how I would have taught it in person. Mm -hmm. like in person, there would have been a whole voting unit and we would have gone through every element of it. And I just, I, I, uh, yeah, I didn't feel like that was the right move. Um, in this context. And so I didn't, so I've, yeah. I've done these yeah, sort of 10 minute doses. One, one more follow-up and then I want to hear from Kevin, but do you, do you have a sort of end date for those 10 minutes in mind? Is it like 10 minutes through December 14th through January 20th until it feels like it's done? Um, or are you just sort of playing it by ear day by day? Uh, I mean, I think um, it'll be 10 minutes for as long as it needs to be until there's clarity, which yeah. hopefully is January 20th, but like, Again, who knows? 
Yeah. And actually, after that point, it might become a lot more than 10 minutes if we don't have a clear transition. Yeah. At that point, then we're, we're going to be teaching all new things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, good. Um, that's super helpful, Nima. And, I, you know, I mean, just as per usual, like some great concrete guy, you know, uh, hearing you talk about the parameters that are shaping your decision and how you've settled, you know, into something with a routine, you know, enormously, enormously helpful. Um, Kevin, what does this look like for you or for other people in the Cambridge Public Schools or for the educators that, that you've been talking with and working with? Um, it's been a... Um, a deep reflection on how much I have changed, uh, how much I have changed, I would say personally and professionally, um, just as an educator, someone who's uh, deeply rooted in uh, um, history and critical thinking, um, similar to what Nima said about just reflecting about 2016. Um, I, I feel like I've been in, I feel in the last four years, I've been prepping um, for um, election day 2020 and afterwards since 2016. Um, I, I feel that when I came into my classroom um, November four years ago, um, there, there was a lot of sadness um, from students and colleagues as well. Um, and, um, you know, they expressed it with, um, you know, the words, um, folks had tears, um, and, and for me, I, I did not cry and that's not minimizing what other people shared. Um, I felt the sadness and at that time I already, I wrapped my mind that not only was it feasible that um, Donald Trump would win, but that it seemed likely just how history works, um, especially following the election of, um, the first um, black president, um, Barack Obama. And so I remember just recapping, explaining what the electoral college was, um, some of the, the seats that were won back in 2016, students were just asking questions about, um, um, just, just trying to understand like the branches of government and what it meant, what this ripple effect could mean once Trump was elected. And so again, like had discussions, um, I believe a Socratic seminar that took place. Um, and I just remember since then feeling that I did, it, it, it was just neutral on surface level that I felt was not right to do um, the moment I did it. Um, and fast forward, uh, th there was definitely this, this feeling amongst um, colleagues and friends in other districts. Um, and, and those students that I had back in 2016, four years later, who reached out to me, who are juniors or seniors in college, um, it, it, was, it, was as, it was as we were all having the same experience as to, will this be a repeat? And what took place on Saturday for a lot of individuals um, it was this sense of relief. Those individuals that were on the same page, this relief that um, something right took place. But on the flip side, it was like the preparation, the lead up to last, you know, Tuesday and last Saturday, it was, you know, we have all these resources ready. Um, you know, if, if individuals need to debrief and reflect, similar to what 2016 had, those were available. Like many of my um, friends were saying that that was something that their schools were implementing. But this week, the follow-up, whether it's with former students, um, colleagues, uh, friends in another district, it was, yeah, we're just, you know, we're just doing work. And, and, and there was a sense of, of, for many individuals that they, victory was won. Like, like, like the sense of like victory was won and then um, we can go back to normalcy, even though for any history teacher, normalcy wasn't, normalcy was inequitable um, inequality to begin with. And so where I'm at right now as an educator, it's trying to, trying to center this idea that um, there wasn't a pause 
or an ending. Uh, it, 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 the, the, a beginning is, it, it's ongoing in terms of just the impact of this election, um, the impact of politics, the impact of society. And whether it's, um, you know, updating with, you know, news clips, um, whether it's just assigning readings, it, it's just a, this, what I try to do, or what I'm trying to do is be very intentional and underscoring um, what this means, not just for the millions of individuals that wanted uh, President Trump to be reelected, but also the millions of individuals that did not. And for those individuals who felt that once it was confirmed that he lost, that the work is done. And that is something that I feel that I have improved since 2016 and wanted to make sure that we put into context exactly how this is all still intertwined, how there's so much work rooted, not just uh, what happened this past weekend, but just the overall history that is the United States of America. Yeah, I mean, that resonates quite a bit with me, this notion that we have an election, you know, hinging on, you know, in some respects, still an extraordinarily small pop part of the electorate, you know, very easy to imagine results, you know, shifting in either direction. And to some extent, you know, the, the election of the president and the House and the Senate is of enormous consequence. But at the same time, just changing those things doesn't change, you know, it doesn't change the, you know, vastly growing uh, consumer debt that people experience. It doesn't change um, the experiences of systemic racism, um, you know, and, and the way that white people continue to struggle to process their role in systemic racism. It doesn't change, um, it doesn't change a whole bunch of things. And in fact, from a policy point of view, for months, it doesn't change anything at all. And so here you have, you know, what um, a moment which just has this sort of surge of energy behind it, you know, and, you know, and even, I mean, even, you know, some of the, you know, some of the historicness of it feels sort of squashed, you know, like ha having a woman in the White House is amazing, you know, is amazing step forward for the United States. And it just kind of feels like, you know, very easy to imagine other elections in which that would have been just such like a central part of the story of what happened. Um, but instead, you know, seeing, uh, seeing these patterns uh, continue. What, let, let's talk about student activism specifically then, you know, I mean, part of what I maybe hear in your comment, Kevin, but tell me if I'm hearing it wrong, is, is something like, um, you know, a little bit of a release valve on the pressures for student activism, the sense of like, oh, all right, well, you, you know, there's, there's probably stuff to protest and work on, but like, this isn't as, uh, you know, it, 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 um, this election isn't going to trigger sort of, uh, um, a lot of activity on that respect, um, you know, but, but certainly, um, you know, like the, the, you know, an ongoing issue in the democratic party is the, um, you know, tremendous electoral success and recruit recruiting black and Latino voters. And then, you know, ongoing disappointments from those groups that they're, um, you know, that they're not well represented in, uh, in policy, um, or in other ideas, you know, some, some of which seems to be like, um, you know, a fruitful place for, or the, or the kinds of conditions under which student activism um, swells. So I don't know what, like, as, as you know, um, what, 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 are, what are you hearing from students? What are you hearing from the, the youth activists in your community about, you know, how they're thinking about the, the intersection between this particular electoral outcome and their goals and their, you know, plans over the next couple weeks or couple months? The sense that I'm getting is that um, it's somewhat of like three different mind, mindsets. There's one of individuals, four. There's one of individuals who are stuck. Um, I, I, I think wanting a clear example of, oh, this is happening. Um, the house is on fire, so I'm going to go to the house. But the, the, and the house being on fire would have been the re-election re of Donald Trump. 
So for many individuals, they needed that. They don't have that. So it's, it's more of like, we're just waiting until January. Um, there are individuals who, um, uh, you, the energy from like activists is, is the sense of um, urgency and anger. And, and it, it's this idea that they feel that we should keep the momentum that took place earlier this, this summer um, um, after the murder of George Floyd on, on top of um, you know, the, ongoing, um, the ongoing impact from Breonna Taylor earlier this year. Um, for, for these activists, it's like, okay, we, we were able to dance on the street for two minutes. Now, now they, they want individuals to continue to push, but there, there's a sense that they feel like they don't know where to go. Um, there's a third mindset of this where um, they're waiting for the lead of teachers uh, and how teachers are responding um, to this, um, whether it's going to be a lesson plan or we are going to plan to go out into the streets or we're going to go to, and then there's a force, there's a force where individuals who are Trump supporters, um, they're looking as, do they fit in? Like, do it, do they, are they quote unquote allowed to be activists and fight for uh, you know, investigation to voter fraud? Are they allowed in these spaces that they're in? Are they allowed to do that? And so you have all, again, like these four different mindsets of this energy and the common denominator that I'm seeing is that there, there, there's this onus on us as educators um, and the role we play in how each of those mindsets are able to process what's going on. Um, and that, and, and, you know, that, that tension of, you know, politics and social justice, um, activism and supporting what to do, that's, that is all relevant in terms of young people feeling that they have the tools yet may feel like, are they allowed to pick it up um, or not? Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of tug and pull um, that I, um, I have gathered over the last um, week or so. Yeah, that's great. You know, that, that uh, um, uh, it's a moment in which, in which as things are changing, people are trying to refine themselves. And part of what they're doing is looking to their teachers to help figure out what those local norms are going to be. How, how does that change your practice or how would you recommend to others that they, that they take that into account? Um, you know, what do you feel like you're doing for that Trump supporting student or those other students who are looking to you for, for, uh, for guidance? Um, it's, it's, it's honestly setting a, um, an environment where, um, where the context of this election um, and um, the context of, um, again, human rights, social justice, um, systemic um, harms that is embedded in this country um, and what a re-election of Trump would have done um, and what the election of Biden slash Harris may present an opportunity. Um, and contextualizing for that student who may feel that their president was robbed. Um, and being able to set that context without being naive that, you know, that individual, and again, there's all these difficulties through um, virtual, but uh, that individual connected to their family, um, maybe another teacher that may feel the same way, maybe administration that may support that. But there, there is this moment, and it's, it's a moment that's, that has always been there in education, but it feels like we're going to define it as there's a moment that I think the being intentional in how we not just frame um, individuals who may have opinions that may go against human rights, but also how we are able to articulate with 
the evidence. Um, and, and that intentionality, is, that explicitness is so important um, that we can't shy away from. And so, yes, it, it would be if, if there is a student that is a Trump supporter who feels sad, it, it will be to, um, if I have the energy for them to, to say, for them to share how they, how they feel, but also to then, again, contextualize, um, contextualize from them exactly whether they've noticed or not, what Trump represented, what the reaction represented um, and how that impacts. Um, and again, I know that's a difficult, difficult for so many individuals to do, but not doing that honestly sets up this this environment for individuals to feel complacent and comfortable um, because of this moment, which can then easily lead to another Trump um, in um, 2024. And so th it, it, there, there's definitely a sense of that straightforwardness um, with historical context um, for that student who may feel um, who may feel that the information they're getting is valid um, and as our job as history teacher is to in many ways um, in, in many ways underscore um, how history has shown that um, it's 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 challenging yet um, you know, history has a blueprint on how we should not repeat ourselves Nima, what in that resonates with you? I mean, especially this idea, maybe you're hearing some young people squeaking in the background there. Um, uh, what, what in this resonates with you, particularly about this idea of the expectations for of teachers as kind of tone setters and way setters in an unsteady moment? I mean, I think that something I have spent a lot of time thinking about is what are the limitations of electoral politics, right? So when it comes to the lived experiences of my students, you know, kids were asking very quickly, is, is this going to change anything for me? Like, what, what concretely do you see being different? And, um, and the answers to those questions were like, no, like in some ways, no, in lots of ways, no. I was like, you know, the thing that concretely will be different is probably there won't be someone saying like egregiously offensive things about your identity or my identity on the daily, like that will feel different. But from a policy perspective, if you're an undocumented student, the Obama administration's actions towards undocumented students were nothing to be proud of, right? Like when you look at issues around incarceration in our country, you can track them right back to Joe Biden um, and criminal justice work that he did when he was in the, in the Senate. So in the ways that like uh, policy comes down on kids, like there is no sense of guarantee that like things are going to change in ways that are gonna improve their existence or their family's existence, looking at history as our guide. So I think the thing I've been trying to talk with kids about is, it's kind of that Tip O'Neill idea that um, all politics ultimately is local, right? And so what does our activism look like locally? How do we take care of each other in our school, in our district, in our city, what is the work we are doing here around intersectionality, around supporting people and seeing their full identities, around holding up those identities and making space for those identities? And how do we make that the, the basis of our work? Because a presidential election happens once every four years. You can like put all kinds of energy and hope and stakes into it, but ultimately it happens once every four years and you can't know that the result of that is actually going to yield some positive benefit on your life. But if you engage in local activism and local politics, like there are actually changes that you can make that you will see the results of because you will see shifts in your city budget. You will see changes that happen around who your elected representatives are, what communities they represent. Like, I think that's kind of where I really feel like kids were going. Um, I mean, the other thing that's really inspiring in this is that, you know, young people have spent the last six months, uh, seven months of this pandemic, eight months, I guess, um, online a lot. And that means that their awareness of social issues is incredibly high. Like, I would actually say higher in some ways than any group of students I've taught previously, because while there's a lot of dancing that happens on TikTok, there is also a lot of activism on TikTok. There's also misinformation on TikTok, but like, 
they're being exposed the activism, to activism, the dancing and the misinformation can all be in the same video. <laughs> it's exactly right. So they're parsing a lot and they're engaging in that sort of conversation or dialogue with each other around like, all right, what's real here? What's fake here? What? And sometimes they're wrong and sometimes they're right, but their exposure level is really high. So when I have young people asking me, how is a black trans woman's life going to be different because Joe Biden was elected? Part of me is like, I don't think any other, like that question wouldn't have even been asked 10 years ago or eight years ago, or potentially six years ago, or potentially three years ago by an eighth grader in a middle school in Boston. I don't know that that question would have been asked. So I think we're at an interesting moment where young people's awareness is very, very high. And, and if we're in a position to sort of like help them see how that awareness can shape um, their local context and what the avenues are for engagement in their local context, like there is a lot of power there in a way that like, a once every four years presidential election, like I'm not sure, I'm not sure they're gonna feel that same level of efficacy or agency really live itself out in that context. And that, I mean, that seems very, very wise to me. And it also seems like wise advice that can operate in a lot of different contexts. Like I, you know, I could imagine uh, being a teacher, working in schools, you know, um, very divided between um, political parties um, saying, all right, you know, um, how do we, how do we think about these conversations and our advocacy locally? Um, and there may be, may be ways to, to shift the conversation, get people engaged. And I think it's also just right to continue to remind folks that, um, you know, the, the nationalizing of our politics doesn't change everything that you just said about the tremendous importance of localities, municipalities, school districts, states, like in our actual, you know, lives. Um, Anna asked a question um, uh, that it would be great to hear from both of you, Nima and, and Kevin about, um, which is how, how, how transparent are you with your own political views as you're um, discussing these issues with your students? Kevin, the question is directed to you. So we'll start, we'll start with you, but it'd be great to hear from you, Nima too. Um, well, Anna, one, thank you so much for um, sharing that. Um, I been teaching for eight to nine years. Um, short answer, uh, yes, um, teachers should. Um, long answer, eight to nine year teacher, um, even during my grad school experiences, maybe the early part of my career. Yeah, uh, even as a history teacher, I'm being advised to um, not share my um, viewpoints. Um, so in many ways, having the, the core in my classroom may hint at what I am doing or what I'm doing when I'm leaning. Um, but I, 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 I remember that I didn't necessarily say that um, I was voting for President Obama over uh, Mitt Romney um, back in 2012. Um, and over time, I realized that um, that was wrong. And the reason why it was wrong is because what was being ask of me um, whether other colleagues were doing it or just from what I've seen across the country that by doing this, by sharing your personal political beliefs um, is the sense of your indoctrinating um, students. Uh, and even just looking at the word indoc indoctrinating, uh, that's not the case. And for me, what I present in the classroom, in my curriculum, my personal political beliefs, um, I am presenting you know, the values and belief um, and asking and showing students how to critically challenge that um, if and when they can, uh, which is the opposite of indoctrinating, which is just presenting something and don't let it be challenged. And what I've seen over time is that those individuals that so many of us say we need to support our black and brown and our black and brown students um, and to validate their agency within a community that um, wasn't created for them in terms of the history of this country, that silence, um, that being mum about your personal um, political belief, they notice. And there have been so many times where students early on in my career, they will look at me and say, why didn't you speak up for me? Like, like, like why did you feel that someone's opinion of me was as valid as my literal existence, my humanity. And, and when those moments happened, whether it was um, an, 
um, an indigenous person, whether it was an African American, whether um, it was an undocumented uh, immigrant in my class, um, whether um, it was a lesbian in my class, like these individuals noticed that it's cool that Mr. Dua has these posters and he has these Socratic seminar, but there's also the sense of he, he's holding back. And as an individual that we are looking up to, we're learning from, does that mean that we should hold back in, in our identity and how we are learning and processing? And, and for me, that transparency um, for them in my instruction was needed. Um, because again, I would not want this sense of, an in the, of a student to walk away from my instruction, um, not just me saying it and them running with it, uh, but me saying it, um, us discussing, us unpacking. I wouldn't want them to not even have that opportunity and to think, does my teacher as an educator and as a human being, does this person value who I am, not just as a student, but also as an equal, as a person as well? Um, and, and again, I know it's challenging for individuals for whatever, for their own identity, but for me, it's, it, it is something that for the last several years, I realized it was needed in order to, um, um, to articulate that defending my humanity, um, just like our students defending their humanity should not be, um, something that they compromise. Um, and again, if that calls into students wanting to um, ask questions or parents, if that calls into that, then I, you know, what makes history educators um, awesome, and yes, I'm by saying that, is that we look at the blueprint that is presented to us and we can contextualize as to why and how this is all relevant and helpful um, in a true sense of education. Nima, do you have anything to add to that or uh, perspectives from your classroom? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just say that I think like in healthy democratic spaces, people are, their identities are full. Their identities are complete and they bring their full identities into those spaces. A space where people can't bring their full selves, whatever their full self includes, um, isn't a healthy democratic space. And like my goal as a teacher is to create a healthy democratic space in my classroom where people can evaluate their ideas and have conversations with each other and see what other perspectives people have and kind of weigh and be in the process of like the kind of discourse and dialogue that to be totally honest is like completely absent in our country writ large right now, but that we're still fighting every day to create in our classrooms. And if I'm trying to create that space, like I have to come into that space authentically myself, right? And that doesn't mean that I like lead and I'm like, I'm just gonna tell you before we even start the conversation who I'm voting for. It doesn't mean I'm doing that, but it does mean that like my values, my beliefs are part of that conversation. I'm, um, you know, like I really, I think about, I think that there is a really heavy kind of uh, assumption that the silence and sort of quote neutrality that um, that pervaded a lot of educational spaces for a long time. Like there's a sense that that was objective and like it wasn't objective. It was, to use a big grad school word, it was hegemonic. Like it was, there was an agenda. There was a dictating opinion that was driving the silence. And so, you know, I went to school in a town where we had a school named after Stonewall Jackson. That school is still named Stonewall Jackson today. Like there's an agenda behind that. It's a silent agenda, no one's talking about it, but there's an agenda there. So to act like being transparent about your beliefs is bringing an agenda ignores the fact that all of that silence also has its own agenda. There, there's some great research from um, a woman who's now the Dean of the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin, Diana Hess, um, who in part has done survey research with students on this. It would be interesting, it was done about a decade ago, maybe more, um, and it'd be interesting to have updated. Um, but in that survey research, Diana Hess found that students believed very strongly in teacher rights of expression. Um, they believe, they, they overwhelmingly believe that teachers should be able to express their views. Um, and then as oftentimes shows up in survey research and it's hard to know exactly what to do with, um, they were quite, they, people are quite sure as individuals on average um, that their beliefs are not shaped by teachers and they're concerned that their peers' beliefs are shaped by teachers. Um, so not quite sure exactly what to do with that. But, but I, think, I think both, I, you know, 
Kevin, I think you give a compelling argument for for the case of the fullness of self. Um, and then Nima, I think you give a really useful sort of tactical detail, detail, which is like getting around to the fullness of self doesn't mean that like that's the thing you have to start with. At the, you know, your lesson doesn't have to begin with a positionality statement. Um, you you can you can give a lot of space for people. You can wait for students to ask you. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways of getting into that. Um, well, I want to bring in Sarah and Josh, um, and both invite you to to add anything that you have to the conversation, but Sarah, I know that one of the things that you've been enormously helpful in doing on the Youth in Front team is just kind of keeping track of the news, keeping track of resources that are being developed, keeping track of conversations that are happening in other places, examples of student activism. Um, are, are there things that you've seen in the last two weeks or that you've been uh, keeping track of that you feel like uh, more of us should should know about or, or are some good examples or helpful ideas that you've seen bubbling up for navigating these times? Yeah, I've definitely um, been trying to keep track of some of the resources and um, trying to send them out to youth and from participants. Um, I actually uh, was just reading an article with our very own um, Mira Levinson today with Harvard Graduate School of Education's Usable Knowledge. Um, usable Knowledge is a great, um, resource that HGSE puts out on a lot of different topics, but um, Mira had a great article about a lot of, or a great interview about a lot of these topics. It's called Conversations Ac Across Differences. Um, and this idea um, that both Nima and Kevin have been talking about of making space for students, um, starting with thinking about um, yourself and your own reflections, which both, oh, thanks Justin for popping that in. Um, starting thinking about yourself, where are you coming from and how much do you feel you can take on with students, um, which is an important thing. That was another, I think it was facing history. The first step that they had for post-election was self-care, just thinking about sort of where am I um, and what can I handle um, in terms of talking to students. And then another thing I thought was helpful, particularly as we're talking about um, classroom is trying to ground these conversations in specific texts. Um, I'm an English teacher, so that always um, is something I love. And of course we have history teachers here. Um, but just thinking there's so many sources of information out there right now. Um, people are looking in different places and some of them are more reliable than others. So trying to ground um, conversations in these specific texts. So looking at a specific nude source together. Um, and that I think can be a helpful place for teachers to get um, into that kind of a brave space is something we talk about in the course and we're talking about here and it's, and it's academically grounded. So finding a way to sort of ground in a common common text that people are looking at, I think can be a helpful concrete tool. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so then another resource uh, that we've been working on in the lab, um, Josh, you've been taking the lead on a course about um, teaching controversial issues with opportunities to practice controversial issues. Do you wanna talk a little bit about this and, and share some resources with the group? Sure. And, um, and, while, and let me just say, while Josh is talking, if there are other folks who are here who have questions, or have comments that they want us to weigh in on, um, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Sure, uh, thanks Justin. So uh, a couple of years ago, I started working with an uh, undergrad and now a grad student um, on developing resources for teachers on teaching uh, controversial or challenging topics with students. Um, so especially in the aftermath of Trump's election in 2016, uh, we heard from a lot of teachers that, you know, how do I talk about these issues with students? And in a teaching systems lab, we've developed um, tools called practice spaces, which are simulations of classroom situations that allow you to sort of practice and reflect on key decisions in teaching. So we developed a simulation called Discussion Leader, which sort of puts you in the role of a teacher and you interact with different students. And it, it's really a, a way to think about, okay, how do, what would happen if a student said something that was racist or xenophobic, how would I respond to that? What happens if I have an interaction with students where one student is clearly uh, violating classroom norms? Um, so we had developed that and sort of been working on this for a couple of years now. And then the COVID-19 pandemic happened and all of a sudden, you know, everyone was going uh, online and had, had to think about how to have these discussions online. And so, over the summer, we talked to a number of experts, uh, including uh, Kevin, about 
you know, how should teachers uh, approach these situations? How should they think about how to have these conversations online? And, I was, you know, I was thinking you have the election coming up, you have, uh, you know, the protest around uh, racial inequity and systematic racism, you have, you know, conversations about the pandemic and COVID-19. So what's the best way for teachers to talk about these with students if they're going to see them in a Zoom room that may they had never met them in person? I know one thing that came up in all the conversations was the importance of relationships with students that you know you have to establish relationships first that you can't just sort of start the class the first thing say you know okay now we're going to talk about the election everyone um so that's uh you know super important and and of course we talk about some strategies for doing that we also provide some you know ideas about how to use technology effectively um you know there's a lot of limitations with using technologies like zoom but there are also ways that you can integrate technology um, and that can actually be really effective and productive for having conversations, particularly for students who may not um, be comfortable speaking. I know um, my wife is a high school teacher and a lot of her students, you know, their internet connection is slow, they don't feel comfortable on camera. And so with technology, you can sort of have other ways for students to participate that's not necessarily um, speaking on camera. So um, I encourage you to check out the course. We have uh, built a practice space that's about teaching controversial issues uh, online. And so we call it breakout rooms. So you actually kind of go to different Zoom breakout rooms and, and see what's happening in those conversations. Uh, and we also designed a lesson plan uh, to use with students where you can sort of have them kind of practice engaging in conversations in a simulation. So I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but I definitely encourage you to check out that course. Terrific, great. Um, well, thanks so much for sharing that, Josh. Um, I hope that'll be a super helpful resource for folks. Um, so this has been a great conversation, um, some really concrete resources, um, some great big picture uh, thinking about how to address our stance as teachers. And then I, of course, I always appreciate everybody's humility in saying, you know, there's nobody who's an expert in this moment. You know, none of it. We don't know how to teach during a pandemic. We don't know how to teach during a constitutional crisis. Um, we don't know how to teach when those things are happening at the same time. Um, so we just do uh, do the best we can um, with, with, uh, with each of those things you know, and my, I mean, my parting words to folks would be to um, continue to talk with your colleagues, listen to your colleagues, um, and, you know, and, and find communities of practice that can help you think through these issues, because there, there are no, uh, there are no experts here, and there are no uh, straightforward guidelines. And then I think we should also just all be gentle with ourselves, too, um, that we make the best decisions that we can every day. Um, and if we get some things wrong, you know, we, uh, <laughs> We um, we forgive ourselves and we go back to class the next day and say, hey, I don't think that went right. Let's try it. Let's try it again or try it a different way. Um, uh, Nima, do you have any parting thoughts or, or final things you, you want to reflect on or leave in folks' minds? Uh, no, I, I think uh, I thought one other thing that I was thinking that um, has been a really inspiring and powerful thing to teach about has been the uh, grassroots organizing that has happened around getting out the vote. So that is another place where I think there's a lot of opportunity to teach um, about the voter outreach work that happened in Georgia, that happened in Pennsylvania, like really looking at the organizers and organizations doing that work. And so as we think about how we help students see all of the work that happens for the four years leading up to a presidential election, um, that's another space where I think there is a lot of teaching that can happen that can really inform how young people see themselves um, as activists in the world. That's great. Kevin? What has also been inspiring has been seeing how um, youth and uh, some of my colleagues um, wanting to um, just reflect on this idea of um, returning returning this return the climate back to its original self um, and and that's been a combination of looking at uh, primary sources uh, from indigenous peoples um, looking at um, you know the history of reparations and trying to see how have efforts how have stories in the past how do they align with what um, is happening today or what is not happening today. And similar to what um, Nima said, but just looking at various 
grassroots that that are doing that type of work to essentially go back to um, this sense of 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 giving of, of giving what it deserves slash what is earned um, to individuals to communities um, and so you know it's 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 always inspiring to see folks um, read read and annotate and dive into it and ask questions um, um, not just amongst themselves but to other groups who are committed to this type of work um, so that's that has been um, it, it, it feels like as an educator, uh, as a history educator, um, you know, job is being fulfilled, so. That's great. Well, Nima, Kevin, Sarah, Josh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, folks in the chat, feel free to look at all the links there for a bunch of resources uh, from us, from Facing History, um, to all of those of you who joined us, thanks for being with us. For those of you who are watching or listening uh, afterwards, thanks so much. Um, Enjoy the rest of Veterans Day. Um, thank a veteran, advocate for veterans health care, um, and uh, get some good rest. And we'll get back in it uh, with students tomorrow on Thursday. All right. Thanks, everybody. Really wonderful having you all here. Bye. Thank you.